Imagine what that's like. You walk outside, you turn on your phone, there's no signal. You go back inside, you turn on the TV, no signal. You turn on the radio, no power. You turn on the faucet, no water. You turn on the fridge, no refrigeration, your food starts to spoil. You walk outside, cars pile. Part of such a blackout is very real. Now there are a few things that we all know could disrupt life as we know it and make it very bad. Our success will depend on whether you leave this auditorium and tell your friends, tell your families, tell your classmates, tell your coworkers. Bienvenidos a un nuevo video. Estamos en la ciudad de Nipo, en la provincia de Yeyang. Gracias a todos por seguirme en mis vivencias. Se ha anunciado en una conferencia de TED Talk, la misma la cual muchos de ustedes ya conocen, en la cual habló Bill Gates, en donde habló de una posible cepa, un posible virus en el año 2015, en la época en donde nadie sabía nada eh, acerca de lo que iba a pasar. Pues bueno, también hace poco de publicarse este video, eh, un empresario habló de una posible emergencia con un gran apagón, algo a gran escala, lo que se le debe poner mucho cuidado. Este empresario es Samuel Feinberg, que, que es eh, cofundador y director de una organización llamada Elena, la cual ya está recopilando en su grupo varios miembros de renombre importante dentro de los Estados Unidos. Lo que se le hace extraño a muchos es que esta conferencia fue realizada atrás en el año 2017, pero el canal de YouTube TED Talks apenas sacó a la luz este video a mediados del 2020 para la comunidad de habla inglés. ¿Será alguna otra conspiración loca más? Así que ustedes también tienen el espacio para hablar aquí y ver qué consideran que es esto. Les he traducido una parte de toda la conferencia para que ustedes puedan sacar sus propias conclusiones y aquí está. We are terrible at listening to warnings about disaster. Back in April, a man named Jack Phillips is in the communications room of a ship motoring across the Atlantic. Jack's got his headphones on, he's listening for radio communications, and I don't know if any of you have ever plugged your headphones in to a computer or a phone when you've left the volume all the way up at 100%. I've done it a lot, and it and you're like, ah! That happened to Jack because he got a message transmitted at maximum volume from a guy only a few miles away in another ship. And so, you know, this thing comes through, it almost blasts the headphones off Jack's head. He goes, ah, and gets really, really pissed off. And he yells back at this guy, you know, what are you doing, you bozo, uh, transmitting at maximum volume? And the guy's saying something about an ice field, and Jack is like, look, my ship is big enough not to have to worry about an ice field, we're gonna be fine. Turns off the radio, gets back to work. Later that night, Jack goes down into his bedchamber, goes to bed, and never wakes up. Because in April 1912, Jack fell asleep aboard the RMS Titanic. We are terrible at listening to warnings about disaster. In the mid to late 1990s, a woman since famous named Brooksley Bourne was the head of one of the government regulatory commissions responsible for preventing awful financial crises. And she was kicking up a huge fuss about the deregulation of derivatives. And she was making so much noise that the big banks got pissed, pulled some strings, and forced her out of her chairwomanship. About 10 years later, the world entered the Great Recession. We are terrible at listening to warnings about disaster. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, a man named John O'Neill was a great agent at the FBI, but his colleagues weren't too happy with him because instead of doing his work, he kept yelling about some ragtag group of fighters called Al-Qaeda that were supposedly trying to attack the United States. John was forced to resign, and on September 11th, 2001, he died at the World Trade Center, where he'd taken on the position of head of security. We are terrible at listening to warnings about disaster. Right now, just a few hundred miles away from here, in Florida, thousands of people sit without electricity. Imagine what that's like. 
You walk outside, you turn on your phone, there's no signal. You go back inside, you turn on the TV, no signal. You turn on the radio, no power. You turn on the faucet, no water. You turn on the fridge, no refrigeration, your food starts to spoil. You walk outside, cars pile up, no street lights. In big cities, if you're in New York, LA, San Francisco, Chicago, DC, within three to five days, the food is gone from the grocery stores. And the trucks that the city counts on to resupply that food aren't coming. Within a week or two, the sewage system starts to overflow and contaminates what remains of the water supply, and people start getting cholera. Societal order starts to break down. There's mass evacuations. The emergency responders who during the first few days were desperately trying to evacuate people trapped in elevators have now left their positions like many did during Katrina to protect themselves and their own families. But why get depressed and worry about something like that if there's no way it could ever happen? There's no way we could ever experience a large blackout affecting the entire or a large portion of the United States of America. The unfortunate news is that the threat of such a blackout is very real. Now, there are a few things that we all know could disrupt life as we know it and make it very bad. There are four ways that could happen. The first won't surprise you, it's a cyber attack. If North Korea can hack Sony Pictures, and if JP Morgan, which spends hundreds of millions of dollars a year on protecting its systems, can be breached, and Target can be breached, and Equifax can be breached, that the much smaller companies that run independent parts of the grid, that control maybe just one or two or three of those flaps on our hot air balloon, can be breached far more easily. Two, solar weather. Every 100 to 200 years, the sun strikes the earth with a big burst of energy known as a coronal mass ejection, a CME. The last big one was in 1859. It was known as the Carrington Storm. And it exploded a bunch of telegraphs. So that was the large stuff that relied on electricity. But society didn't care. Who needs telegraphs? Unfortunately, we really do need our national grid a whole lot more than the people of 1859 needed telegraphs. One of these, a CME, a small one, hit Quebec in 1989. Within 90 seconds, six million people lost power. Scientists predict there's about a 10% chance, a one in 10 chance of a large CME striking Earth within the next decade and taking out all or a portion of our national grid. Terrifying. Three an electromagnetic pulse attack, like the kind North Korea threatened us with just a week or two ago. The way that works is very simple. A big bomb, usually nuclear, goes up into the atmosphere, about 30 kilometers of height or greater, explodes, and emits a burst of electromagnetic energy that fries anything with electricity larger than about a foot and a half. Computers down, cars down, motorcycles down. It was built after 1984. Disaster. Four, a physical attack. In late spring, early summer of 2013, an unknown group of individuals attacked the San Jose. They cut the communication line and they disappeared less than 60 seconds before police arrived on the scene. We don't know who they are. Now that substation wasn't a critical one. But if someone were to attack one, or God forbid, nine of the critical ones, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Because it's not easy to replace these things. They're huge, they weigh tons, they cost you know, millions, tens of millions of dollars. We have to buy them from Germany and South Korea. The lead time on these is a year. It's almost impossible to transport them. They're so heavy you need special permits from the government to transport them because they might take out the bridges because they weigh so much. Most of the railway lines that were used to put them in originally were decommissioned 30, 40 years ago. Really hard to respond to. Why do people buy life insurance in dramatically higher rates after their spouse dies, not before? Because we are reactive, not proactive. Why did we start screening for firearms at airports after 9-11, not before? Because 
we respond to things after they happen, rather than inflicting a little bit of pain on ourselves now to prevent a lot later. I work for Helena, a global think tank of extraordinary individuals focused on executing projects that improve the world, focused on solving big problems that matter, like this one. Alongside our members, extraordinary people, Nobel laureates, four-star generals, finance billionaires, former foreign secretaries, Academy Award winners, human rights activists. We have been holding over the past six weeks meetings with experts on this topic. People from NOAA, from NASA, from USGS, from NATO, from the CIA, from the US Congress, from that very same Congressional EMP Commission. This audience watching online and all around the world decide to put up a fight. Just by knowing, all of you are now part of the solution. But knowing is not enough. Our success will depend on whether you leave this auditorium and tell your friends, tell your families, tell your classmates, tell your coworkers, tell your dog about this problem. Whether you tell your senators and your congresspeople how much you care. Whether you donate to an organization that campaigns on this issue. Whether you organize in your communities, in your homes, in your schools, in your places of work. Our success will depend on whether all of you remember the story of Jack Phillips and decide to get up out of bed and pull the brakes on the Titanic like he never did. Thank you. En la caja de comentarios de aquel video en inglés mucha gente especula o piensa que esto se trata de alguna especie de vaticinio igual que lo que pasó con el tema de la conferencia de Bill Gates en la misma empresa. Y otros simplemente dicen que esto se trata de traer a la mesa algunos de los problemas normales que podrían presentarse en un futuro próximo, prevenirnos de algo que podría pasar en un futuro. Bueno, para mis suscriptores antiguos desafortunadamente no les traje las vivencias, pero no se preocupen, más adelante seguiré con este formato ya que este video necesitaba eh, que todo fuera explicado de una manera correcta. Vale amigos, espero que les haya gustado, no olviden suscribirse, compartir para más videos como este y estamos conectados.